Welcome to this uh, seminar, which is uh, organized under the auspices of the Rust Change Project, which is financed by the Petrosam II program of the Research Council of Norway. Um, my name is Indra Överland, and I work here at NUPI. And uh, today we have uh, two presentations about sanctions and the Russian petroleum sector. Uh, the first presentation will be by Louis Skyner, who is a, a, an old colleague of mine from uh, NUPI from many years ago, who has also worked for Statoil uh, for several years, uh, including in Moscow, uh, and uh, currently works for Clifford Chance, uh, a law firm in Moscow. Um, and the second presentation will be by uh, Daniel Fjartoft, who is part of the Rust Change Project, uh, has also been at NUPI many, many years ago, uh, uh, for a briefer period, uh, and is uh, one of the founding partners of Sigur Group, which works, uh, which specializes in uh, the Russian petroleum sector. We will start with Louis' presentation, and then we will go straight to Daniel's presentation, um, and afterwards, uh, Aril Mu, who is the uh, leader of the Rust Change Project, and uh, former director of Fritjof Nansen Institute and senior research fellow there, uh, will give some comments on the presentations. And after that, we will open for uh, questions and discussion uh, with the audience. So, first, Louis. Thank you very much, Indra. I hope everyone can hear me. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, some of you may remember I was here September last year, giving a, a presentation on, on sanctions. And one of the main questions was, how bad will it be? Uh, well, for those of you who went to Anders Oslin's presentation this morning, uh, you'll think it's an absolute disaster. Um, what I'm going to say, actually, is going to uh, complement a lot of what he says, but I'm going to hopefully uh, paint a more nuanced picture. Uh, and that primarily is because I represent a law firm uh, in Moscow. Um, for those of you who know Clifford Chance, we're, we're a London-based firm who have our reputation because of our work with finance institutions. We represent the, the big Western banks and the big Russian banks. So uh, we have to survive. And one of the ways we are surviving now is we're working on projects where money is coming from different sources. And you can probably all guess where. And we'll, we'll touch on that in the presentation as well. I thought we'd start by looking at, you know, the. As, as, as Oslin did indeed this morning, the, the sort of the key uh, figures and why the slowdown we've seen over the last year should not, as the Russian government portray it to be, uh, be seen as a result of sanctions. Clearly there was uh, a number of structural issues that have been exacerbated by sanctions. And I think that's important to e emphasize. The second thing we're going to try and do is differentiate between the impact of the oil price and sanctions. Um, this is really a double whammy for the Russian economy in that it suffered both from a slip in the oil price and sanctions simultaneously. But I think it's important to understand their impact. And why we use the word current and future productions is because I think one relates more to current production and the other to future production, i.e. production after 2020, when, when current reserves are depleted. We're going to look at the US and, financial, US and EU financial sanctions and look at their impact on different sorts of financing. You, you hear in many presentations, as we did this morning, references generally to financing. Well, obviously, the financial world is more complicated than that. And there are many different sources of financing available to corporates and to banks. And what we'll try and do is give you a flavor of where the impact has gone. Because the different sorts of financing are used for different sorts of activities. I think that's very, very important when you look at the oil and gas sector. Uh, you don't get project financing for exploration work because no one wants to take the risk. And similarly, you need project financing for development and production of a project because it's going to cost you $20, $30 billion. So the, the, the different role of different players, what we'll look at in the third section, we'll look at M&A activity, and then we'll look finally at, I think, very interesting development is the way in which the, the move towards China has obviously been accelerated, but it's also become more complicated. Because obviously the Chinese understand the Russians need money, which gives them more to negotiate with. And having been in Be Beijing a couple of times over the last six weeks, uh, it's very, very interesting to see that play now in terms of uh, 
um, perspective. The Chinese are happy to sit there for the next six months, and the Russians need something <laughs> signed by Victory Day when the, when the Chinese president turns up in Moscow. So that, it's an interesting dynamic. Structural slowdown. Um, point two, Silyanov, the Minister of Finance, he's tried to estimate how much the decline in oil prices and the sanctions have cost um, the Russian economy. Well, of course, the impact is much, much greater uh, than the actual figures because of the slowdown in, in domestic production. It was already down to 1.3% growth in 2013. You saw flat growth in 2014, and now we're expecting a contraction of 3 4 5%. It's anyone's guess. Why is this? Well, obviously, you've got lower export revenues, increased capital flow, very, very important. And it's the third point we're going to focus on today, which is the interruption in international lending. I think we dwell on the word liquidity. It was interesting in the Oslin talk today, he, he basically suggested Russia was insolvent, which it's not. Russia is not insolvent. Um, and indeed, you know, Russian corporates and Russian banks are desperate to pay off foreign debt. They want to be solvent because they don't want to be caught in this exchange rate cycle where it's very, very difficult for them to calculate their liabilities. But what we are seeing is an increasing liquidity crisis. And when I mean the liquidity crisis, I mean the access to money is being restricted. And that's what's very, very important going forward. Oil price slide and its consequences on current production. So obviously the, the revenue Russia realizes from oil exports and refined products has declined 6% in ruble terms year on year. But, as we see in the second bullet point, for most major Russian producers, the decline in oil prices and the fall in the ruble dollar exchange rate have offset each other. And the reason is, is that if you're a Rosneft or a Lukoil or a Sorgutnefti Gaz, most of your costs are denominated in rubles. So your cost base has actually shrunk considerably. If you look at some of the larger fields, they have a break-even cost of $7 a barrel. And I think on average, you're talking roughly about $25 a barrel for an onshore conventional field in Russia, which is almost as low as the Arab states. So when you look at current production, it's not being impacted. And that's what we've seen is the fact that year-on-year -year production actually increased last year. And certainly for the first quarter, it hasn't, hasn't dipped. And... The impact of key free cash flow, obviously, it's, it's very, very important for Russian producers to keep producing. The question is, what do they do for their capex? What are they doing for their capital investment? And that's what we're going to look at in the next slide, because this is where the sanctions do hit. We've talked about this before in my last presentation. You've probably had a number of people stand up here and talk about the new projects between Rosneft, Statoil, Eni, ExxonMobil. Well, those projects that were signed up in 2012, 2013, uh, they were initiated because the Russian government understood it needed to get access to its Arctic offshore and to develop onshore tight oil reserves. And it needed not just Western financing, but experience and technology to do that. And that's where we see the real impact in the fact that the sanctions that have been imposed, both financial and the export controls, are stopping the export of technology and services needed for that exploration. It's something we've been working on actively for the last nine months for Rosneft uh, to try and get the authorizations necessary um, from Luxembourg, uh, because all these project operators are established in Luxembourg, for them and their partners to import into Russia equipment and technical services, and they haven't got them yet. Um, so this is going to have an impact on, on future production. And then, of course, we come to the financial sanctions, which is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation, because it's the financial restrictions, and you can already see this, um, they are clearly impacting on the ability of Rosneft and Novatec, people forget about Novatec, um, to raise financing. What are the financial sanctions? Well, I won't go through these slides in too much detail. I've, I've included it so you have something to take away with you. But you have a, both 
US and EU financial sanctions. The US ones are basically restricting US persons transacting or providing finance of longer than 90 day maturity period with a listed entity. And you can see the listed entities are Rosneft, Novatek, Transneft, and Gazpromneft. 90 days, well, for those of you who are not familiar with financial markets, I mean, a lot of loans are of less than a 90-day maturity period. Um, but if you're talking about developing projects in the CARA Sea on the basis of project financing, obviously you're talking about a lot longer than a 90-day maturity period. And, you know, the typical expectation would be that uh, a project in the Arctic would get at least 60% project financing. Uh, Project financing is used for many reasons. Uh, I think the most important one, if you represent the foreign partner, is because it disciplines your Russian partner. If you're financing the project off your own balance sheet, then obviously it's harder to use mechanisms to control the way in which the project's developed. If you've got banks involved, first of all, you need discipline in terms of your documentation, and secondly, the bank's going to be very, very demanding about how that project is operated and the revenue flows. And that's why, typically, the Statoils and Exxons want to get project financing, because it means they've got a mother-in-law in the room who's going to tell Rosneft how to behave itself. So this, this sanction basically precludes um, the provision of um, project financing. And we, this, we, we, we see the same with the EU sanction. You have a similar sanction introduced um, on purchasing, selling, uh, dealing in transferable securities market instruments with an ex maturity exceeding 30 days. It's interesting, on this score, the EU sanction is much, much tougher than the US sanction. They've got talking about a maturity period of 30 days. Um, so this has basically stopped all interbank lending, which means that the Russian banks, the state banks, we haven't mentioned them expressly in this presentation, but the likes of VTB, Sparebank, VEB, Gazprom Bank, who are all included in the sanctions, all listed, they can no longer go to European banks and US banks and get loans. Neither can the energy companies, because they're also listed. So this really does suffocate them in terms of their access to financing. We then have, and this is an interesting, at least from you know, a practical perspective, uh, provision in the U European sanction that talks again about providing uh, credit up to 30 days and introduces various exceptions. Financing for non-prohibited imports or exports, uh, emergency funding, and as you can see in the second section, it just gives the criteria for when these exceptions should be applied. I think one of the interesting differences between the US and the EU sanctions is the US sanctions, they are effective from the date they're published. So if we take the export controls, they were published on the 6th of August. That means that if it's not on a ship on its way to Russia, it's not going. Because if you need to get a license under the export administration regulations, there's a presumption of denial. It's the irony of the US regulation. It says that in these circumstances, you need to get a license, and by the way, we're not going to give you one. Um, the EU sanctions, of course, were fudged because of all the vested interests in Europe, um, and it created a, basically a, a hole whereby if you have a framework agreement or an agreement that creates obligations signed before the 1st of August, which is when the initial sanctions were introduced, then uh, you can apply to the competent authorities of the member state in which you're registered to get the appropriate authorization. And it's this loophole that obviously Statoil and Eni uh, and Rosneft are trying to exploit because they are saying, well, all our risk service agreements, all our uh, framework agreements were signed in 2013, so therefore we can run a whole project on the basis of the fact that we had an existing agreement. And you see a similar uh, exemption in the wording for the financial sanction. We're going to look at some of the consequences in practice because the problem is, is that these sanctions are drafted primarily for the banking sector. And the types of uh, 
loans and the types of arrangements concluded between energy companies for financing don't have the precise terms that are needed to qualify by, for exemptions. If you see here, you have to include provisions regarding the length of the repayment period, drawdowns, disbursements, interest rates, calculation methods. Typically, the loan agreements that are used to carry finance exploration projects, say where Statoil will agree with Rosneft to carry finance all its exploration projects, it won't have included this detail. And therefore, it doesn't qualify for the exemption. So this is why the energy sector has been badly hit. What's the impact? Well, a lot of people talk now about Rosneft's outstanding foreign debt. 28 billion rubles, US dollars, sorry, they wish it was rubles, um, is due to be repaid in the next two years. Um, well, we've already seen that Rosneft has a lot of free cash flow because its production costs have dropped. It's got a lot of producing assets, so it's got money. The other interesting thing is it received $68 billion in 2010 because of the prepayment contracts it concluded with CNPC. That amount is actually open to dispute because Rosneft hasn't been able to expand the infrastructure in order to deliver the quantities that CNPC agreed to. So CNPC are actually reducing the payments, but they've clearly got enough money from the prepayment contracts and free cash flow to cover short-term existing obligations. So people who tell you that Rosneft are going to go bankrupt, that's, that's just not the case. They won't. Um, what is interesting, we, we've seen this uh, because this is the sort of work we would typically do, is that the trading houses like Vitol, Trafigura, who would have pre-financed a lot of Rosneft's work, they're not able to. And the reason is simple, is that even though if we go back to the exemption in the sanction, even though you're allowed to provide financing for export of goods, it's clear that when you pre-finance pre something, you're not simply financing the export of the oil. You're actually giving them basically a working capital facility, which they're going to use in general. So the, the, the common position now is that you cannot conclude prepayment arrangements with Rosneft. And that's exactly what they've been doing for the last five years with BP, with CNPC, with Vitol, with Trafagora, with Gumfor. That has been the way they have been financing their development. So that, that avenue is no, no longer open to them. Impact on EMP activity, EMP exploration and production activity. We've just mentioned this, that the foreign partners of Rosneft typically use EU entities to finance their activity with Rosneft. So the normal structure would be, if you take the Statoil project, you'd have a project operator established in Luxembourg, which doesn't have an interest in the license, but is going to develop the field that is subject to the license under a risk service arrangement. And both Rosneft and Statoil, because it's tax efficient in terms of um, transfer of funds, would set up Dutch holding companies in order to invest money into that Luxembourg company as a shareholder. And this is the same for the Chinese as well. It's the same across the board. The reason is actually quite simple. It's because the Dutch have the best bilateral tax treaty with Russia in terms of withholding tax. The irony of history, of course, is that 160 Dutch citizens were on MH17. So which national authorities are the least likely in Europe to grant authorizations in accordance with the sanctions? Because in order to share, finance your, your operations in Russia, you would have to get permission in Holland to issue shareholder loans or loans either to the operator in Luxembourg or directly to, to Rosneft. So again, this is another illustration of how actually the financial sac sanctions are really, really biting on the ability to, to, to fund activity. Then this is the $64 million question for Statoil, for Exxon, and for any, is that the carry financing arrangements that they drafted in 2013, whereby they sort of make a equity injection. It's not really a loan, and it doesn't have a uh, drawdown period. It doesn't have uh, clear repayment dates. It's a sort of working capital facility to allow Rosneft to, to develop the project through to the, 
first exploration well or the appraisal well, whatever it is. Um, these agreements, they are also subject to fat sanctions. Of course, the argument is, is that they were signed before 1st of August 2014, and therefore future drawdowns aren't subject to, to, to the sanctions. But the European law is quite clear. If the drawdown doesn't contain precise information as to repayment period, maximum amount, etc., then it is caught. So even the intercompany facilities that have been agreed are actually, in theory, restricted. I don't know what the position of these companies are on them, but certainly our advice and the advice of most lawyers in Moscow would be you would be a foolish man to be continuing to draw down from your carry finance agreement. Unless, of course, you take out the Dutch holding company and you would do it from Norway, because then it would be the Norwegian authorities who would be basically throwing the hot potato. Um, if you threw it to the Dutch authorities, you know exactly how the Dutch authorities would, would react to it. M&A activity. Now, this is interesting because what do Rosneft do? Well, Rosneft have to find some way of accessing money in order to generate capex, capital invest for capital investments. So where do they go? Well, they go to the Chinese. And they say to the Chinese, why don't you buy 49% of Vancor? The Chinese say, fine, we'll buy 49% of Vancor. They say, actually, no, we're not going to sell you 49% of Vancor. We're going to issue new shares, because we don't really want to give you 49%. But what we do is we, we need your money. European sanctions, issuing any money market instrument, which would include a share, transferable security, with a maturity exceeding 30 days, is prohibited. So this sort of typical structure a Rosneft would use in a transaction, an M&A transaction, in order to access additional money from the company that's purchasing part of their project is not open. And that's why, for those of you who've been following the story of Vancor, Vancor hasn't happened. Because why? Well, CNPC used Dutch holding companies to make all investments in Russia because of the bilateral tax treaty. And CNPC, like other companies, don't want to set up joint ventures in Singapore or Hong Kong, because Hong Kong and Singapore don't have the same bilateral tax treaties. So even the Asian companies who are being encouraged to invest into Russia are being caught in the same trap, that the restrictions prohibit the types of structures that are, are typically used. And this is why, in conclusion, you know, I think it's, it's pretty safe to say that it's accelerating Russia's move east, but it's actually complicating Russia's move east. Um, we all know the story, 2008, Russia realizes it can't be dependent upon European buyers. Uh, it needs to rethink its energy stra strategy, uh, market diversification, you know, Asian markets, LNG, everyone knows this story. Um, but if you actually look now at where those projects are, and we'll do this on the next slide, uh, you will begin to see quite how the sanctions have impacted on that relationship. 2014, June or May, 30-year gas supply deal, CNPC, the power of Siberia, uh, lots of trumpet blowing and <coughs> noise in Moscow about new strategic alliances. Um, as Anders Oslund said this morning, where's the 25 billion that the CNPC promised in prepayment financing? They provided it to Rosneft for the ESPU expansion. They haven't provided it yet for, for the power of Siberia. Because now talk about the Altai pipeline as an alternative. But everybody understands that you will hit the same issue. And the issue basically is, is that the Chinese understand that, one, it's very, very difficult to set the price of gas because gas is typically indexed to a basket of carbon products, one of which is oil. Uh, and two... You know, they hold all the cards in negotiations. And when we've been in Peking, uh, as I said, last couple of months, their attitude is, well, we can sit here till, you know, until Christmas if you want. Um, whereas the Russians are clearly desperate and increasingly desperate to get, get money on the table. LNG. Well, this, I think this is where you see the biggest impact of financial sanctions because, you know, typically LNG projects are very capital intensive. 
Uh, for those of you who know about Stockman, I mean, the, la the last estimates when Statel exited Stockman was the CAPEX would be something like $55 billion. So these aren't cheap projects. Um, of course, normally in an LNG project, because the price is so high, the volumes are committed beforehand. So before you make an FID, a finan financial investment decision, you've already found your, your buyers and you've concluded contracts with them. But what's happening in the world now? Well, you've got two things. You've got the collapse in the oil price, which is, those, if those of you have been following the LNG price, which is based on the JCC, the Japan Crew Cocktail, has halved in the last three, four months. And you've got the sanctions that are restricting your access to go to banks and raise projects financing. So this is why, for example, Yamal LNG, um, whose majority shareholder is Novatec, so they're therefore caught by sanctions, has to find $19 billion um, in project financing in order to continue the project. Rosneft, well, Rosneft wouldn't be able to get project financing, so it's not even an issue for them. But what it means is that you know, at least two elements of Russia's rethink, i.e. focusing on Asia and diversifying, are in big trouble. And a lot of people would question whether or not they're actually going to happen. And then oil. Well, clearly oil, you know, is always going to be important. And the Asian routes are more and more important for Russia. If you look at the comparative export last year, uh, there was increasing refocus to Asia, and that's set to continue over the next 15 years. Uh, but, you know, as with the gas issue, uh, replacing dependency on Europe by China is just as dangerous a game, in the sense that you have pricing pressure on, on Asian markets, um, you have the availability of additional supplies from, others, from other producers, uh, and demand is growing much more slowly than had been expected because Chinese GDP is, is slowing down. So even on the oil front, Russia's strategy is, is, is now being questioned. So what are the common concerns we see in practice? Well, certainly if you look at the international companies, they are increasingly uh, sensitive to, to the challenges that Russia is facing. Um, one of the reasons why so many big deals were signed up to in 2013 was that the Russian government changed its tax legislation in order to basically make any off offshore project free of export duty and at a minimal mineral extraction tax. Well, clearly now, as the Russian budget is receiving a lot less money because it's earning a lot less money from, from, from the, the sale of oil and gas, the temptation, of course, would be to increase tax. And any increase in those tax is going to push these projects NPV below the threshold needed to keep Western companies interested in it. I mean, it's already marginal. So, I mean, any increase in tax would destroy the project economics for a, a Statoil or an ExxonMobil. This is, of course, an academic discussion because they need $85 a barrel anyhow to make these projects marginal. Uh, but if you add an increased tax rate, you, you're already in big trouble. Currency conversion, this is something that's, you know, I, I think the Russian government are very, very conscious of going there, and actually they've been quite disciplined, and they have refused, expressly refused to even consider it. Because once you start introducing capital flows, that's when all the money's going to leave Russia. They haven't done it yet, but if you look at the fact now that every month you have this cycle in the exchange rate, uh, it, why is there a cycle? Well, it's because the big state-owned companies are being sat on by the government in order to convert their dollar earnings into rubles to hit the deadline for, for tax payments. So this is actually one of the things that on a monthly basis is, is keeping the ruble at, what, 51, 52 a dollar now. The other thing, and this is one of the reasons our business has so been badly impacted, is that Russian companies now just want to use Russian law because they don't see a reason to use English law. Why would you use English law? Well, you typically use English law because you have to go to a bank and say, please finance our project because, as you can see, the risks are allocated in a way that will mean it's going to actually work. So the English law is the ingredient you need in order to access financing. If you can't go to foreign banks, then why are you going to use English law? Increasingly now... A lot of work is doing under, being done under Russian law. 
But even the Chinese find that, you know, frightening in the sense that if you have a Russian law governed shareholder agreement, you have to go to a Russian court in the event of a dispute. So if you have a dispute with Rosneft or Gazprom or Gazprom Neft, you're in a Russian court. You could, well, you, it doesn't even, you, I don't even to, need, you need to illustrate the, 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 the concern. Yeah, and the last couple of issues, I guess they're quite technical, but the idea is really to show that if you were to use the sort of risk matrix that any company in the world or any major oil and gas company would apply to a project, um, it was always difficult, I remember from my Statel days, to, to, to get enough ticks in order to justify the project to go forward. Now you wouldn't get one tick. Uh, because of the, all the reasons we, we've been through today. And that's it, yeah. So it's as, it's as, as gloomy as Oslin's presentation, but the reality is, actually, if you look at the way in which the sanctions have been worded, if you look at the clear intent of the regulators to ensure that they are complied with, then it means, as Oslin said, nobody is willing to lend Russia a dollar anymore. Okay. Thank you very much, Louis, for providing a, a really insightful perspective. Uh, having lived in, in Moscow for the last uh, six years or so and really been on the inside of a, uh, a lot of these things. And also uh, a real insight on the inside of a mind of a lawyer. And uh, what I saw was there was a, a lot of complex text there. Um, now we will have uh, Daniel's presentation which I think he's an economist, so uh, I expect it to look a little bit different. And he's going to talk specifically about the impact of sanctions on oil production, uh, which I think is an important question, not just for Russia, but also for the world and for Norway, as Russia is the world's second biggest oil exporter. OK, am I on? Well, thank you for having me. I'm here to present a, um, a very fresh report that I've been working on together with uh, Indra through the Petrosum II program, financed by the Norwegian Research Council, within the Risk Change Project, where we uh, look at uh, changes going on uh, institutionally in the Russian oil sector. But with the current uh, game-changing events, we found it uh, interesting to also look into uh, the effect of sanctions. And uh, my objective here today is to try and uh, illustrate for you how the sanctions uh, could impact Russian oil production and uh, also in what particular way. As of, as Louis was also talking about, as of approximately July 2014, the EU and the US uh, were, came, became aligned in terms of uh, sector sanctions for the Russian economy. Uh, focusing on finance, energy, and defense. This is to make it short. The EU, in its justification, is focused on its moral obligation to react following the downing of the uh, Malaysian Airlines flight, uh, being sorry to hurt. And the US has been much more frank, saying that the whole intention is to inflict an economic cost on the Russian uh, government and uh, Russian economy for its actions in the Ukraine. There is one big question that is will, if this hurt is inflicted, will this hurt help? Unfortunately, this is something that uh, one will have to think about uh, beyond this seminar. I think uh, one of the discussions that has what should I say, been dominating is in so far as of the presumption that sanctions or damage to the Russian economy uh, will help. There are s some people will argue that they do, others will argue that they don't. But in general terms, just to recap what Louis was saying, the export ban on uh, equipment uh, precludes export of equipment going to deep water exploration and production projects, offshore Arctic, and uh, shale oil production. On the finance side, uh, state banks and uh, key oil, uh, oil companies have been uh, targeted, which importantly in our case means that uh, as we were saying, Rosneft cannot borrow money uh, abroad anymore. And also, the Russian banks cannot borrow the money for Rosneft and issue it to them, which leaves uh, the Russian state as sort of the 
last option. And if we look at energy's share in the Russian economy, if you want to inflict uh, damage, uh, the energy sector seems very much uh, the right thing to target. Equally so, in terms of oil production, uh, the state-owned owned companies which are under sanctions, Rosneft and Gazpromneft, uh, together, through their uh, jointly owned uh, subsidiary Slavneft, control more than 50% of Russian oil production. So uh, the Russian policy that has been uh, underway throughout the 2000s of increasing uh, the role of the state uh, in, uh, in the Russian petroleum sector uh, have now had the final consequence that about 50% uh, of Russian oil production is uh, conducted by oil companies under sanctions. However, uh, the impact so far uh, is not easy to identify. Uh, month, Rus monthly Russian oil production has stayed pretty much on trend up until uh, March, end of March 2015. This doesn't mean that uh, it won't fall or could decline. And already in 2010, and it was reiterated in 2011, the Ministry of Energy uh, voiced concern that unless specific measures were taken, Russian oil production would start to decline uh, more or less immediately. And uh, the recipe for avoiding sort of the low case scenario here and, and sticking in the high case wa was tax breaks, uh, specifically relating to the export duty and the mineral extraction tax. As we also see here from the... that production has initially stuck or been... Uh, in track with the high case scenario for the first part of the years, in the last couple of years, been slightly below. So recently, uh, a draft energy strategy for towards 30, 2035 has come out, where they sort of uh, continue this projection of current uh, uh, production levels with a slight growth, uh, stating which differs from the Ministry of Energy's first outlook, saying that, well, we won't have that big uh, peak around 2018, 2019, but we will also not have the dip. Um, in any case, in order to avoid this decline, which the ministry at the time was warning could happen already in 2010, the ministry lined up a, what some people call a pipeline, but a development schedule um, of fields that would have to come into production. And here we have, as this was issued before 2010, you have the Peter Lomnoy field, which came into production in 2013, uh, Lukoil Silanovsko field, and, and several others, which were uh, sort of spread out in time. Come sanctions, however, we see uh, that approximately 12 of the 19 fields in the government's pipeline uh, are affected by uh, either financial or equipment ban uh, sanctions. Of the fields in the pipeline, there's only the Shell gas bomb, uh, Salim, one that I have been able to identify as being directly hit by shale oil uh, sanctions. There are two offshore fields in our chart, but as I said, Pyrrhus Lomno came on stream already, and uh, Lukos Filanovsko field is, uh, is shallow water. So presumably, uh, these are not hit. Um, of course, this development schedule is in no way uh, exhaustive because there are a countless number of fields that could be developed. But this is sort of uh, the ministry's vision of what had to come on stream in order to avoid a decline in 2012. And now, co coincidentally, um, the four largest fields here, uh, which are under sanctions, question, will they be developed? And uh, in total now, we have about 70% five percent of the planned res resources from this pipeline oh, sure thanks uh, are uh, under question and as Louis was talking about this uh, big interest in will uh, Rosneft be able to uh, finance the capital expenditure necessary to push this uh, pipeline ahead because uh, 10 of these 19 projects are Rosneft projects which is uh, makes it a, the company a com considerable player also in, in future going forward. If we look at the debt repayment schedule of, of, of Rosneft, we just see here that they 
One of the reasons ROSNET is so big is that it acquired T and Key BP in 2013, which has left it with the law with left the company with a large debt, and some 23 or something uh, billion U.S. dollars are are due to be repaid uh, in 2015. So, if we try to add up uh, what ROSNET has to pay to service this debt, and what ROSNET uh, potentially would have to pay in order to stay on track with its uh, development plan, we can get our uh, bar on the far left here of our chart, uh, assuming at the 2014 investment level. Of course, free income is not sufficient to, finance, to, to cover all these costs, the EBITDA uh, box there. And well, where to get the rest of the money? As we were talking about, since fin out outside financing is blocked, uh, the government is the la sort of the obvious uh, place to person to a place to call, and Rosneft has filed a uh, uh, an application for 1.3 billion trillion rubles in order to finance this development. Uh, it was initially at one point reported to be around two trillion rubles, which was promptly declined because the this money is supposed to come from the National Welfare Fund, which is one of Russia's two sovereign wealth funds. And uh, at the point in time, depending on the ruble exchange rate, so somewhere in the uh, vicinity of three trillion rubles. So then Rosnitz was essentially asking for two-thirds of, uh, uh, of this bag of money to finance its, its, uh, its pipeline. This was denied, and uh, if we, the Russian government now is in negotiations, and it was out of this uh, 1.3 trillion ruble application, uh, signals are, reports are, that Rosneft could probably expect something in the area of 300 um, uh, billion rubles. So subtracting that uh, from our required capital and adding uh, Rosneft's uh, warned 30% cut in uh, capital expenditure for 2015, we still have a big gap uh, that in some way or the other uh, would have to be filled. And my intention is not sort of to say uh, that Rosneft will go bankrupt. This isn't the point. The point is more to illustrate that um, going forward, uh, finance is going to be a big challenge uh, for the company. And uh, of the two choices, investment in new production and servicing old debt, there's going to have to be some sort of trade-off between these two. And uh, Rosneft has uh, you know, acknowledged this as well and signaled already that uh, two large fields, uh, the Ruskoye from our pipeline and Yuburechna Tachomskoye, which is the largest, will be postponed. Uh, if we add one more field for which Gazprom Neft has applied uh, for financing from the same welfare fund, so we can assume that if it's applying for financing, there must be some trouble, and it's likely that the project will be postponed. Then we can add, add this up together here in this chart, which sort of shows, uh, on the one hand, the plan uh, from 2012 of how these fields were going to come into production and support the total of Russian oil production, and sort of uh, with the area graph behind it showing what the new plan is. And in total, the gray uh, area here represents uh, the postponed production that one thought one could expect, but which uh, is not uh, going to come uh, on stream as initially planned. And uh, obviously, this is going to have uh, some impact on uh, total Russian oil production, it, which, is sort of which is illustrated here. That rather large uh, area of postponed production in the previous slide is, uh, uh, of course, large in the context of three fields, uh, somewhat smaller in the context of uh, total Russian oil production, but nonetheless, of course, significant. So we sort of see here below, as I check it area, is the ministry's de decline scenario. And then going on the way top of all our thing is all our graphs is the uh, energy strategies uh, target production. So we sort of see that of this production that one expected would come in, uh, in addition to what is uh, to replace the decline, 
then some 370 uh, million barrels of oil will uh, be postponed, leading to a dip in uh, Russian oil production, uh, maybe in the vicinity, using just these numbers, around, around 2%, um, reaching a minimum in 2018. This is, of course, uh, using uh, numbers available. It's using but numbers that have been made available from uh, the Ministry of Energy and combining them with Boston's uh, postponement schedule. Of course, there's one issue in my mind with this chart. It is that the chart assumes that uh, production will climb back to target quite rapidly once uh, these, field, these, these three fields reach their target uh, you know, plateau production level. And uh, one might argue that this is entirely possible. One can also argue that, well, uh, if you were planning to develop a certain amount or had the capacity to develop a certain amount of, of new field at any given point in time, if you then uh, didn't do it in the past, how are you going to be able to do what you didn't do in the past and what you were planning to do initially at the same time, which is essentially what you'd have to do in order to climb. So that's why bef before I uh, conclude the, my presentation, I'd just like to throw out a, a food for thought scenario for you where um, Rosneft uh, focuses on developing these three fields and sticking sticks to its uh, renewed uh, schedule, but has to sacrifice all other uh, capital expenditure and its share of replacing resources for this time period. The consequence then is that rather than having a short decline or a temporary decline in climbing back up is that uh, Russian oil production could go into a, a long-term decline and uh, uh, falling down to about 7% 7, 7 below 2014 levels by 2025. Uh, this is coincidentally in line with some of the uh, predictions made by uh, officials in the Russian oil sector, uh, but it's also uh, the one graph that is based that is takes made the most freedom, I would say, out of the limited information available. But I think that uh, realistically, we would probably be uh, somewhere in between uh, the first production outlook with a limited dip and then uh, recovery and a more long-term uh, period of reduced production. Just to... Uh, mention one important thing is that in order to avoid the scenario, which uh, given the importance of Russian oil production to the Russian state and the importance of Rosneft to Russian oil production, uh, one will have to find uh, money in some way or the other to avoid the scenario. And uh, although it is hard for us from the outside to sort of point to the obvious sources of such financing, we have to be prepared that th this uh, could happen. Uh, the Vancor deal is for some 10% framework agreement. Of course, it may be in trouble. This, uh, there has also been talk about the Chinese investing in the uh, refurbishment of 100 wells in Ingoshetti or something, uh, Chinese, sorry. Uh, these things could materialize, but are, are hard to put into numbers and, and put into graphs. Another obvious option is that uh, the Russian government's reluctance to issue 1.3 uh, trillion sorry, rubles from the National Welfare Fund uh, could be uh, rejected uh, by the presidential level, because, uh, and that would actually fit quite well with the pattern we've seen before, where the government is in somewhat, some way uh, less enthusiastic about Rosnet, wanting to uh, uh, privatize, wanting to limit uh, access to license, but where such things have been trumped at the very top. And I think going forward, this will be a very interesting development to see what happens to uh, Rosneft's uh, application for funding. There's a lot of uh, arguments being put forward that uh, we need this funding or production will drop. 
And uh, on that we note, and just like to conclude saying that uh, financial sanctions are the ones have a clear impact and are probably the ones that have the most impact in the short to midterm, uh, predominantly because Russian oil production to such a degree hinges on Rosneft as uh, the dominant player. And even though Rosneft could, uh, can endure uh, low prices with operating expenditure uh, in the vicinity of $5 per barrel, capital expenditure average in the vicinity of $5 per barrel, uh, the company could, in a sanctions-free world, probably ride this off quite easily by attracting uh, funding from other sources. This door is, uh, seems at the moment to be closed. So then the question is, how will uh, Rosneft manage both uh, repaying its debts and uh, investing uh, the amounts needed for Russian oil production to stay on track and not dip? We have put forward two potential scenarios how we can look at this. But I think it's important to bear in mind that although Rosneft is very important and Rosneft is under sanction, it's not the, the only company and uh, Luke Oil as well, for example, has warned that it will be cutting back capital investments in uh, 2015. And uh, following the reasoning behind the preceding two graphs, this will also have an impact on uh, Russian oil production. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to the discussion to come. Thank you very much, Daniel. If you have any comments or questions, please remember them. Because first to comment is going to be the real expert, Arjen Moore from Fitch of Nansen Institute. I think they have understood that there are some very good experts on these issues in, in, in this room, and certainly not uh, among them. Uh, thank you both, uh, Luis and, and Daniel, for very, very interesting and detailed um, analysis. Uh, I won't repeat um, I think you said I, I learned a lot uh, from uh, from getting these more legal insights, which I think are extremely important because they also show how how countries and actors who are not participating in the in the in the sanction are also very very heavily affected. Uh, and certainly, your analysis on the, the development of oil production is is extremely interesting, and I, I think it's uh, very important to 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 get this time perspective. On, <clears throat> on developments, that sanctions have an effect, but they have a different effect over time. And certainly there is a lot of inertia in, in Russia, which we should always remember, it's a huge, huge machine. And uh, even if uh, technological uh, embargoes have been implemented, they will, it will take time before it makes, it, it makes themselves felt, because there is a lot of uh, equipment already uh, at hand. So in two, one, two, three years, things may look different if, if sanctions are uh, continuing. I would just like to add some uh, some observations on the political framework here. Um, as as you pointed out, Louis, uh, it's it's sort of it's really uh, methodologically a little bit different, difficult to 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 distinguish between uh, different explanations for what's going on. Basically, there are three three groups of explanations. One is, as you said, sort of the fundamental economic problems in Russia and unresolved uh, uh, reforms. Uh, then you have the oil price, of course, and you have the sanctions. And there have been some attempts at of, of weighing these things. I think it's interesting to note, uh, if you follow the, uh, the discourse, now, there is a discourse on this in, in the Russian media. I think it's pretty... Um, close, in a way, to the, what you are saying. There is an understanding that the sanctions are not the main problem. In fact, the Minister of, uh, of Economic Development said it straight out. Among these three uh, reasons or explanations, the biggest problem is our own policy. I mean, that's the Minister of Economic Development saying that. So, so, so if the sanctions are lifted, all the problems won't go away. But they certainly add to the situation. Uh, in the sort of preliminary draft of a, a new um, energy strategy in Russia, which has been underway for some time, it's, it's quite clear, and it's been put into numbers, the importance of, of new, uh, new um, 
uh, sources of oil in the years to come to, to, to offset the decline in, uh, in producing fields. So by 2035, uh, quite a lot is expected to come from, from uh, untraditional sources, 80 million tons in fact, 50% from the continental shelf, and uh, 47 from other new traditional fields. And all these uh, additions are clearly very much affected uh, by the sanctions. So if the sanctions continue, Russia is in for a very, I would say, a very, very difficult uh, future. But uh, uh, in the shorter term, the question is how uh, does it affect production? But I think it's also interesting to to discuss how they affect sort of the political framework of the power balance. And that comes a little bit closer to the ultimate goal of these sanctions, which, which is, of course, the change of policy, which is not the focus of this seminar. But that is basically what they're intended to do. I won't go into that final question. But uh, I think uh, uh, it is interesting, when, especially when you look at the prospects for, for, for um, uh, Rosneft that uh, this may have some, some political uh, implications too. Uh, as was said here, uh, Rosneft really approached the government to, to get a lion's share of, the, of one of the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, really sensation, it was, it was denied, but still it shows how desperate uh, Ros uh, Rosneft was. And maybe it also shows how secure uh, Sechin was that he would receive those money, but he didn't. I think clearly Rosneft's political strength and position has been weakened uh, over the last uh, months because of that, but also because of their very drastic purchase of, um, of foreign currency to repay debt that really contributed very much to the, to the, to the uh, very deep fall in the ruble before, before Christmas. Uh, certainly, it was not something that uh, the government of Putin was very pleased uh, with. And what we see now, and what was uh, alluded to by you, is there is some sign of um, liberalization in the Russian uh, uh, oil uh, sector. Uh, there's been a very, very strong tendency towards monopolization, very, very strong tendency to giving Rosneft a very, um, the best uh, pieces and, uh, and, and privileges. Now we see quite concrete uh, attempts of uh, changing this uh, law on strategic resources to let in uh, foreign companies, mainly mainly uh, Asian perhaps, but could also be others. And even uh, uh, there are quite concrete proposals to, to change the monopolization on the continental shelf. But that may be uh, too late since all the best uh, acreage has already been handed out. Uh, Rosneft occupies, you know, 800,000 square kilometers of continental shelf just in the Arctic. So that may be too late. And in fact, uh, Luke Oil's deputy president said that he wouldn't invest anything in the Arctic offshore at the time. But now, but my question is uh, whether uh, this financial um, squeeze could also lead to some sort of transformation of, 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 of Rosneft. Could it uh, be possible that uh, Rosneft would be forced not only to to let foreigners into um, projects like they try to do at Vancouver with the Chinese, but it, uh, to sell off assets, to 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 spin off assets to raise uh, to raise capital, and if so, what does it mean to the sort of the power balance in in the oil sector? As we know, it's 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 the it's really the basis of the Russian economy, so it also may have political uh, ramifications. Uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it like that. Uh, you have uh, probably also in the audience many, many, many questions and comments. But thanks again for your interventions. Thank you very much. Would, uh, would the, either of the two of you like to follow up now, or should we just uh, speed on? Carry on. Okay, um, so we open the floor to uh, more uh, comments and questions. If anybody dares, after such insightful, insightful 
and quite technical presentations. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Kore Herge. I'm a previous Norwegian uh, diplomat, now retired. Um, the main question here to me is one which was certainly touched upon, namely what will be the impact of a smaller energy production in Russia on uh, the political institutions in the country. And uh, if I read the presentators correctly, uh, that impact will be fairly slow in coming, at best in two or three years. Uh, there are very few Russians uh, employed in the energy sector. I think I saw 4% or something like that. So there won't be a massive loss of employment. And therefore, I ask myself and indirectly uh, the experts, um, what will be the impact of uh, this decline which we will expect um, to come? Um, will the decline in the ruble be offset by the fact uh, that uh, most purchasing purchase goods inside Russia um, are of national production? Of course, the, the question then is, what will the inflation be? Um, and uh, what do you expect could be the possibility for a change in policy by the present regime, which I guess is what we are all asking ourselves. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, those are, are sort of many questions at once. But in, in general, I think uh, you're asking about two things. What is the economic impact uh, of the uh, current situation, would, uh, how, how, what will the outcomes be? And the other, what sort of effect will it have on uh, uh, Russian policymakers in relation, I assume, to, to the Ukraine? Uh, first, I'd say that uh, it's uh, the Russian, as you, you mentioned, 4% employment in the Russian energy sector, which also includes power production so far. It's, it's not through this channel that the uh, Russian economy will feel the effects of a reduced oil price or dip in production. Uh, Russian welfare has been uh, supported by increased uh, government spending over many, many years. And uh, the Russian budget has been uh, uh, balanced at an increasingly high oil price. And prior to the current, uh, what some people call a crisis, it was being balanced somewhere in the vicinity of $100. And uh, so there's one effect is that people are spending less. Teachers are re receiving less pay. Uh, people are not so happy about that. Importantly, imported goods have become much more expensive. And although there is a big push to produce uh, goods domestically, which obviously have become much uh, cheaper and more competitive compared to imports, uh, Still, I think uh, the Russian, to bring an example, Yodafone, which is largely made of imported components, will probably not go down uh, as much. But uh, the sort of goods that people want to buy, just as in Norway, what we buy, is almost nothing is produced in, uh, in Norway. And if we were to buy something produced in Norway, we would probably prefer a better quality product produced abroad. And it's a long, it's a long uh, road in order to produce high-quality plasma TVs and, and cell phones in Russia for the Russian population, if at all possible. In terms of policy, uh, will it change? Uh, we wrote an op-ed in uh, the Norwegian DN uh, some time ago where we say, where we say that, on the one hand, of course, it's, uh, nobody likes to see negative uh, economic impact. But on the other hand, as, as Lewis was saying today, it's, that it's uh, not primarily due to sanctions. So if you sort of uh, uh, bow to the pressure of the West, your situation might not improve that much. And you will also uh, not have the opportunity to point to the West uh, to, to shame and blame. So uh, the effect on rationale for changing policy in order to avoid sanctions is, uh, is unclear. 
Yeah, some very interesting questions. I take the ones from Arya first. I mean, I think it's a very, very legitimate question. I mean, typically a company like Rosneft, given its uh, current operating capex restraints, would start selling assets. Um, I think you will start seeing that. Um, I think the problem is uh, valuation, um, and obviously with 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 fluctuations in the exchange rate. Um, and also the currencies being discussed uh, in those transactions, I think it would be very, very hard to, to properly value assets. Um, and therefore that will slow down that process. Um, I mean, whether or not you would see a sort of fundamental reform in Rosneft, as, as you could ask the same question about Gazprom, I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, my sense having worked with both companies over the last six years is is no because I think the way they operate is very much uh, reflective of how, how the Russian body politic works and I think once you start cutting seriously into um, the way they're managed and the way revenues flow in those organizations uh, you're basically looking in the mirror and uh, asking whether or not you, 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 you know you've got the conviction to go through with fundamental changes in the Russian state so I think, unfortunately, that, that isn't a likely result. And that sort of fl flows into what, what Daniel's saying, and it's one of the things that's probably uh, surprising as a, as a foreigner living in, in, in Russia is the extent to which opinion has been successfully mobilized over the last year. Um, and people who you know, previously would have had quite sanguine and sane views on most issues uh, will uh, be talking... Uh, with increased conviction about um, you know the way in which uh, foreign powers are attempting, as, as Putin says, to to to, to restrict Russia and to, to 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 harm Russia, and how how pejorative and how resonant that is. You know th this this is easily a, a substitute for the pain they're suffering so far in terms of reduction in their in their consumption um, and the reduction in their in their spending power. How long that will last, I, I don't know. Um, certainly living in the center of Moscow, you, you don't have a sense of crisis uh, in that you know restaurants are still full 24 hours a day and people are still buying uh, new cars. It was interesting, Oslin this morning alluded to car, car sales. Yes, they're down by 42%, but if you look at the, the Cayans and the... The, the land cruisers and the sorts of cars you see inside the garden ring, no, they're still unaffected. And I think this is an important point, actually, that, you know, that, that what we call the chattering classes in English, not that they do much chattering in Russia, uh, but that the people who basically comprise the political nation uh, or are the sort of loose consensus of interests that would you could loosely identify as, as the Russian state and, and the business that supports it and benefits from it, uh, they still, I think, feel that this is the best solution to, to sort of keep going as we are. There hasn't been a decision yet to start uh, vacating. And indeed, the legislation that's been introduced, this was already discussed before the sanctions, but, you know, the de-offshoreization of the Russian economy, uh, so bringing Russian money back, making Russian money abroad more transparent, um, I think is also making feel, people feel that it, it's better to, you know, toe the line and c keep going in this direction, for, for at least for the time being. Excellent. Hello. Uh, my name is Jorun Saltala from the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy uh, here in Oslo. Um, with reference to your um, uh, presentation uh, about... Um, when you were talking, uh, you were talking about um, uh, Russia turning eastwards to China, um, how likely uh, is it that uh, the Chinese, who's thinking quite commercial, that they will invest in projects without in huge pro projects in Russia without the uh, big uh, international uh, oil companies to be there to assure the finance and to assure that things are, would be done at time and budget. And is, is, is it, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Is it likely? 
It, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think, I mean, CNPC, I mean, they do have a, a track record as operator, so you, you do typically see them going into projects, um, you know, either as a financial investor or as, as an operator. Um, my sense is that you, you have to sort of see the whole portfolio of potential Chinese projects in Russia as a portfolio. You know, we, we tend to, because, you know, we see them as a, a company, we, we tend to think that, you know, their interest in Yamal uh, is in some way related but different than their interest in, um, in Vancor or uh, an asset in, 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 the, in the east of Siberia, just as we'd see their interest in the power of Siberia as something, you know, commercially different. But I, I think the reality is, is that for them... Um, because they understand that the the challenges facing Rosneft or Gazprom are, are pretty similar, um, they would be negotiating um, their interest and what they're willing to pay in those separate projects in tandem. So if they're going to give something on <coughs> Yamal and you know watch the press, uh, the Chinese president's going to Mush, uh, to Moscow on the twenty eighth of May and. It's pretty clear what you know what the Russians are hoping. They're hoping that there will be some big announcement about Chinese financing of Yamal LNG. You can bet your bottom dollar if if that's if a term sheet has been signed, they'll have got a very very good deal somewhere else because that's the way they're going to negotiate. Um, so I, th I think that that's the sort of thing you have to remember when when, when you approach a company like CNPC that they are really representing China China Inc. Um, my my sense, having you know, spent some time with them last month in Beijing, is that you know, Russia was always seen as a very strategic uh, relationship, and one they wanted to develop slowly. But basically, the Russians uh, spent a long time saying, "Well, we're not going to give you any role in our Far Eastern projects." And there was a lot of discussion for many years about you know power projects where they would finance generation capacity with transmission through to northern China. I mean, there were a lot of things that had been on the drawing board that the Russians basically didn't want to, to, to push. Um, and now it's a surprise to them that Russians have turned up uh, and are basically asking for money on the table now. That, that's not the way they see... Uh, that's not a basis of a, a successful relationship. In other jurisdictions, in South America, um, in Southeast Asia, in Africa... Uh, the, the dialogue has been one that they feel more comfortable with and they recognise in that, you know, they are getting uh, consolidated interests in, in, in Central Asia, for example. Um, so Russia for them is also a country where, I think one of the Chinese said it, it's, R Russia's like um, your auntie. Um, you have to invite her to the party because it's impolite not to, but you don't really want to spend much time talking to her. <laughs> so... That, that's the way they see them now. It's some, someone they would defer to for many reasons, but it's not necessarily the one they want to go and talk to at the party. There's other people who are far more interesting. While we're on this uh, topic of China, which is obviously it's not the main focus of what we're talking about today, but it's an important um, sideshow here. Um, the Russians are very dependent on finding alternatives to Western finance, as you laid out. And as you showed with the analysis of their, their of Rosneft's financial situation, and at the same time we see a lot of very ambitious Chinese plans for uh, new infrastructure going through Central Asia, which which is on China's doorstep, but has been for a long time uh, controlled by Moscow. So, is it possible that one of the the I mean, it, when the Russians say, "Okay, never mind the West will turn to China," but is it possible that one of the long-term consequences could be the loss of Central Asia because the Russians simply can't quarrel with the Chinese over Central Asia now that the Russians are dependent on the Chinese uh, for financing and other input? Oh, yeah, Indra, I'm an uh, uh, industry an analyst. The big. Uh, Big uh, geopolitical intrigues, I think, are beyond my capacity to, to fathom. But I think uh, just uh, on the speaking of Russia and China, not that I'm an expert on it, just 
it seems to me that yes, Russia can turn to China and and this, but and they they have been turning to China and they have been attempting and you know from the Kovikta field they've had a pipeline plan to China since the late 1990s if I'm not mistaken and it just never happened. Uh, maybe uh, now they've signed a deal for some was it 10 BCM per year to China, which is uh, is good, but it's. Uh, Russian export to Europe is 150 BCM approximately per year. So, yes, there's a turn to China, but uh, I, th I think uh, East and West uh, will at least be equally important uh, and a, a sort of a full shift is uh, seems improbable. I think that it's interesting. I mean, you, you always assume that the producer holds the cards in the negotiation, but, you know, as people discuss when they discuss, you know, security of energy supply. Um, you know, it's only good if you have a market to sell to. Um, and in that sense, you know, the purchase of energy, if you're a country like China and you're actually purchasing many energy from many sources, you hold more and more cards. So I, I think probably the Chinese strategy is to, is to expand the Central Asian pipeline, to develop pipelines with Russia, uh, to buy LNG, uh, to buy energy from, from Australasia. Um, and as they are increasingly involved in different regional markets, they will have increasing impact on, on pricing. Uh, so I think in that sense, you, you're seeing a significant change. Um, but I, I, mean, I agree with Daniel that, you know, that there is no substitution going on because the, the volumes, they, they, don't, they don't match in any way whatsoever. I mean, Europe will still be very, very important for, for Russia for a long, long time, um, and only if you know the all the plans were materialised by 2035 would you have any sort of parity in terms of uh, of, of volume sold eastwards. And that's not going to happen. Okay, I'm going to ask a question to Daniel, and if there are any more questions, please let me know. And if not, we'll close the session after that. Um, I'm wondering, Daniel, because you had a very complex and detailed analysis with different options. But if we try to cook it down to a worst case scenario, if basically some of the worries that Louis is talking about, about financing and, and these obstacles really work out bad and the sanctions stay in and uh, Russian companies are really struggling with financing, so no new fields come online, apart from things that are very, very close to fruition right now. So nothing new, so there's only the decline and maybe a little, a little Eeyore and fight against the, the decline. How much is uh, Russian oil production going to decline over the next five years? Worst case. This is where, you know, any dedicated analyst would refer to a spreadsheet. But, no, it's, uh, I think, uh, if you remember the graph, you visualize it in your head, you can see the sort of the decline scenario starts at 2014 production, uh, 3,900 billion barrels, and then 2025, 2,700 billion barrels. So it's approximately... 1,100 in total sort of decline. If you divide that over 10 years, you'll have about 100 a billion barrels per, per year, which is, uh, if somebody has a calculator, you could calculate percentage of current production. But it's a quite substantial figure. This being said, I think it's very important to realize that uh, this worst case scenario drawn up by the Ministry of Energy has uh, with it the, uh, its original intention that was intended to spur uh, tax reform. So this is a sort of a, an, a it, it, it's probably realistic, but among the many realistic alternatives, they have uh, likely chosen one that looks worse than uh, one that looks better because uh, it was intended to show that everything will go down if we don't do something and it will go up if we do. So this has to be kept in mind. Russia has, at least for gas production, you know, people have uh, forecasted that gas production will drop uh, as long as I have been uh, working on these issues, and it really hasn't, you know, a little bit because uh, in the financial crisis, but nothing because fields declined and no investment. Same as in the Russian oil sector, people have been saying, you know, since I, uh, the first time I read in 2006, people arguing, you know, that, okay, the Yukos effect is over with Khodorkovsky in jail, no more investments, Russian oil production will decline. But it uh, it didn't, and it has continued, and uh the uh, Russian oil and gas sector has this sort of strange capacity to trudge on. You sort of predict a dip looking forward, and when you look back, uh, things uh, turn out differently. 
And of course, uh, one aspect of this, which is discussed very little, but which may be quite important, is that uh, when the oil price declines, the currency of a major oil producing country falls too, as we've seen in Russia, and the costs of the companies, the, all the domestic costs fall. And we already see this in Norway, where there's a big impact of the fall of the oil price, but we also see some savings, uh, which are, are there are added savings partly from currency and, and because you're still selling in dollars and the dollar is very strong at the moment. Uh, and then you're saving money because you have lower expenses domestically. And of course, Gazprom and Rosneft are famously uh, inflated companies labor-wise. They have a lot of staff, so that's becoming less of a financial problem, problem at the moment. And in addition, the whole downward trend of the industry puts downward pressure on supply industry also. So that's also a factor that I, I think we see in Norway, which must be even stronger in Russia with the stronger decline. You can currency. get, you know, much more production for one dollar in Russia today than you could uh, before the drop of the ruble. It's mm -hmm. quite uh, obvious. And in this sort of, uh, I would say, back of the envelope, um, boldface analysis of uh, Russia, uh, uh, Rosneft's financial outlook, uh, we have corrected for that by uh, correcting for the change in uh, average uh, dollar ruble. Uh, exchange rate to 2014, and what it is at now, which is uh, a drop from some 38 to about 50. So the uh, the the ruble had a, you know a very deep fall, but it had also it ha has regained territory. So the it is what some 20 percent down now compared to the end of last year, or something like that. So the average of last year. So the 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 effect is there, and it it shouldn't be ignored, but it cannot also be exaggerated. Would be my Okay, thank you very much to the audience. Thanks for Louis for coming from all the way from Moscow on his way to London. And thanks to Daniel for an excellent analysis and to Arild for his comments.